Welcome to Recovery Corner, where the many pathways of recovery intersect. This is a space where you will hear personal stories of triumph in recovery, gain insights into various recovery-oriented systems, and learn how leaders across the country are building recovery-ready communities. The Recovery Corner podcast does not provide clinical advice. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of The Recovery Corner. I am Meg. I'm the social media coordinator for Young People in Recovery, and I am here with Lex. Lex, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Meg. Yes, thank you. I am Lex. (laughs) I am the director of communications here at Young People in Recovery. Yeah, and so we are coming here from two different perspectives, actually. We're going to be talking about the festival experience as a person in recovery today. And I am actually a person in recovery. I've been in recovery for almost two and a half years now. But Lex, you are an ally, right? So do you want to talk a little bit about your perspective, looking at like a healthy healthy perspective on the festival experience as an ally, but still trying to like enjoy responsibly at festivals? Definitely. Yeah. So as an ally, right, I am here to support and advocate for people in recovery. And part of that means helping create some safe spaces and being someone that um, is supportive towards somebody's experience when they're at a festival. Um, We know that festivals can be a little overwhelming, right, especially on an early recovery journey um if there's there can be previous there can be triggers right based on previous experiences um some friends may not be as supportive at the festival and may there may be some peer pressure even though you know we think that we're too old to experience peer pressure but it's very real and and fear of missing out is also (laughs) a very real um situation right or like experience to have and so as an ally I'm here to advocate and uh, find supportive ways to to really be the best ally I can be for those in recovery yeah I'm actually really interested in this topic because obviously allies are very good at festivals and always it's a good idea to have a supportive friend there if you are in recovery or even if you're just like sober curious Um, just to have somebody who can help you stay accountable or kind of have a getaway plan if needed, if you experience those triggers. But actually, back in the day, my very first like binge drinking experience ever was at a music festival. Wow. Yeah, back when I lived in Germany. Okay. Quick. I heard the festivals in Germany are wild. (laughs) They are. So I was 17. I was legal to drink in Germany. And it was, things got a little out of hand. And then they just kept kind of spiraling for me. So that was kind of my own impetus, the beginning of my own story. So now, now that I'm in recovery, I'm very interested in helping people figure out how they can responsibly enjoy festivals, whether or not they're in recovery. Some people may try to be completely abstinent at festivals not drink or participate in substances at all or maybe somebody just wants to figure out a way that they can like themselves accountable if they say they're going to stick to one or two drinks to actually only have one or two drinks and just really participate in the festival and enjoy the music without that kind of social buffer that alcohol and substances provide Mm -hmm. Yeah, that social buffer is something very real that a lot of people experience, right, That they, or that they need. Um, I also think that it's important when we talk about recovery at a festival that we also talk about harm reduction at a festival, right? And if someone is using substances, right, which moderation and harm reduction are still part of a recovery journey, is that they're doing so in the most mindful, conscious way possible. And that is using fentanyl testing strips to test the substances, having Narcan on hand. Yeah. So Lex and I actually recently went to the Underground Music Showcase right here in Denver, where we're both based. And we ran into some pretty cool vendors there. We ran into Keep the Party Safe. We ran into Seedlip. And keep the party safe, for example, was passing out Narcan and fentanyl test strips to keep the party safe, as the name implies. (laughs) Touche. But (laughs) yeah, it's really great that there are these people, these organizations that are willing to go into festivals and understand that 
most people, or maybe not most, but a decent amount of people, there's always going to be people who are using substances at festivals or drinking heavily and just making that experience safer through a harm reduction lens by handing out fentanyl test strips, by handing out Narcan and doing whatever they can to help people be safe if they do choose to use or drink heavily. Yeah, and people are very open and receptive to that um, because I noticed that a lot of my friends that were there, they were very, very willing to take Narcan and have it on hand, right? And I just, I think that that's such an awesome shift in perspective, especially with the high amounts of overdoses that are happening now to really play it safe, right? Keep the party safe. <laughs> Exactly. But, you know, it's not enough really to just hand out Narcan because there are always going to be people who you can always just say you shoot it up the nose, give the very, very, very simple definition of how to administer Narcan. But there will always be people who are going to be not quite sure of how to exactly recognize an overdose or they'll be very trepidatious about actually administering Narcan, but it's very important that people, A, know how to recognize an overdose. They know what an opioid overdose looks like. They can recognize the symptoms of like clammy skin, slow or no breathing, et cetera, et cetera. But then also like having a very basic training on how to give Narcan. But then also that third piece is just confidence, being able to step up and act in situations where it is necessary like you're not going to like have experience doing it until you're in a crisis situation so you just have to try or else it may not go well you know but it's honestly kind of hard to mess up narcan administration so you just have to like do your best in the situation and it's most likely going to work out but it's always important to get that training beforehand even if you watch a youtube video The YouTube channel that Young People in Recovery has, has a Narcan training video up and it also has an ASL translation of that Narcan training video. So there are resources out there, but just being prepared, knowing how to administer that Narcan beforehand can save a life. Yeah. And we also have that training on the first Friday, right, which is live and somewhat interactive as well, which our our, our Kareem Braden, (laughs) our Kareem, the Narcan queen, we call her, um, host every every month, the first Friday of the month. And so that's available um, as a resource as well. If you have questions and you really want to dive into, you know, the how Narcan works and what it is. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's not enough to just carry Narcan. We really have to do the training. Um, and then there's also like, you know, a lot of people's experience isn't with substances where fentanyl may be involved, right? Like, as you mentioned, your first festival experience was alcohol. And, and so how do we support people who are in recovery fully, right? Like with, with experiences um, with alcohol and in an environment where there is a high amount of alcohol. And so that's kind of a curiosity there, Meg, like what, what are some things that you do in order to feel more like safe and secure in your recovery when there are, when there is alcohol in the space or other substances? So first of all, I'm actually going to start with back when I was at that festival in Eschwege, Germany, as a 17 year old, you know, drinking heavily, using substances. Even then, I still made sure to know where the first aid tent was. They would give you water. They would give you anything you needed if you had had too much to drink or if you had stumbled and fallen. (laughs) I actually have this memory very, very ingrained into my mind when I was at this festival and I had had a lot to drink. I needed water. All of the security guards at the festival carried water. But my little American self forgot that it is much more common in Germany to drink sparkling water than still water. So I was expecting the security guard to hand me a refreshing drink of cool water. And he handed me seltzer. And it like, it hurt me. It was not what I was expecting. You know, it was not refreshing. I don't like seltzer anyway. But you know, especially when you just like need water. Seltzer is not necessarily the way to go. So that was 
that really, really stands out in my mind. Oh, that's funny. That's funny because one of the tips that I have here for going to a festival or even a party, a music show, right, is to when other people are drinking is to have seltzer or have something sparkly um, in your hand to sip on because it kind of gives that that illusion, right, of having, of being part of the group and drinking. And I think like there's, it's really cool because Liquid Death is doing an amazing job within the recovery and sober spaces, right, to, or the alcohol-free spaces to, with their brand of a can that pretty much looks like it's a beer or it's, you know, whatever it may be, but it's, it's water and it's seltzer water, or there's like a lemonade version of it. Um, so I, I love, and this is not a promo for Olipop, but Olipop, if you want to um, sponsor our podcast, <laughs> this is my favorite seltzer to sip on. Um, it has a little bit of sweet in it. And it's just like, yeah, it, it's nice and refreshing. But that's a funny story because it's like completely disconnected from my recommendation or tip for enjoying a festival in a recovery friendly way <laughs> is to sip on some seltzer, but not for you. It was just really jarring, you know? Yeah, I, I had already been in Germany for a couple months at that point, but I just wanted water. I needed water. I was so dehydrated <laughs> to get something that felt like it was attacking me, like it was a firework in my mouth. It was just like not what I needed at the time. Yeah. But it's I interesting. Can't. And I think that's a, a fun point to bring up that different people are going to have different strategies. They may be aligned somehow because we're both talking about having a drink that is not alcoholic as part of our strategy to stay safe, just yeah. keeping something in your hand so you feel like you're participating. But it's also completely opposite because I'm a still water person. Always have been, always will be. <laughs> and you're recommending seltzer. Definitely. So to each their own, find your own way, find your own beverage that works for you. <laughs> Exactly. And nobody is the same in anything recovery. I mean, YPR, we always advocate for all pathways of recovery, whether that's 12-step faith-based, harm reduction, smart recovery, anything, just exactly. what works for you, because it's always going to be different for every individual. And what works for one person isn't going to work for another person. But that said, we're going to move into some tips for how to enjoy festivals responsibly. Again, take this with your, your grain of salt, put your own spin on it if you have to. These are just suggestions that have worked for some other people that have worked for us. But as always, you are the person who knows yourself the best. You can create your own recovery or your own safety plan based off of these tips. Take what you want, leave what you don't, and then you'll be left with your own recovery strategy for festivals. So at UMS, Lex and I talked to a couple of people who we encountered at the festival and asked them what their tips for enjoying festivals responsibly were. And this is actually exciting because it's the first time that Recovery Corner has ever hit the streets and asked for other people to add their voices into the conversation. So let's hear what Patrick has to say first. Here it is. Hi everyone, we're at UMS The Underground Music Showcase here in Denver, Colorado. I'm with my friend Patrick. Patrick, <laughs> and we're asking him how he stays safe at a festival um, such as UMS. Yeah, I drink lots of water and I dance my butt off. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I mean, those are two my two strategies. I drink a lot of water and I dance my butt off at any opportunity I get. <laughs> what do you think of it? Oh, yeah. I think that, like I said, I always keep water in my hands. For me, it's a still water. Maybe <laughs> not for everybody. Nope. But just the act of keeping something in your hand, especially for people who are maybe socially anxious like I am. Oh, yeah. I never know what to do with my hands. So if I have a drink in my hand, you know, that is something set. I have a drink in my hand. I don't have to worry about what it's doing and like feel awkward about that. So that is part of it, but also just having something to sip on and keeping hydrated is always important. But then also, I like the part about dancing your butt off because the real reason we go to these festivals is to enjoy the music. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
So why do we, why do we need substances to do that? Right. I I love the idea of coming back to the essence of why we're here, why we're at this festival. Right. Yeah. I I like nowadays I go to festivals to enjoy the music. I go to concerts to enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. And now that I don't like participate in substances and drinking, I enjoy it more. I remember it better after I leave. And I wouldn't trade that for anything personally. Especially remembering it. (laughs) Just remembering it because part of the reason I like to do these things nowadays is for the memories. And back in the day, you know, as the kids nowadays say, I don't know why I'm saying that. I am the kids. (laughs) But they do it for the plot. I was doing everything for the plot. But Mm -hmm. now I'm doing everything for the memories because I actually get to hold on to that and cherish it beyond when it's happening and I really wasn't able to do that when I was using substances and drinking heavily because it would be lost in time into the night when it happened all right so with that being said let's move on to hear what our second participant Hannah said so I would say kind of like coming around with supportive friends and moderation and having some fun throughout the day, but also Seed Lip here makes some awesome non-alcoholic beverages, and I'm super grateful that there are these options here just to enjoy, um, you know, I'm staying hydrated. I really, really like the part about having that support system with you when you attend festivals, because if you have people who you trust, if you have friends who know your situation, know you don't want to drink or you don't want to drink too much, who know your triggers, who you trust, then you can say, hey, I need to leave right now. Like I need to go somewhere calm. I need to go find a tree or I need to go find the first aid tent to get water. Having someone who will walk with you or even just someone who won't shame you for going. Exactly. Because I feel I like think it's that's so... Key. Exactly. Because I feel like it's really prevalent in the culture of young people nowadays, but perhaps like further back, that it's always about the party. It's always about the alcohol. It's always shameful if you can't keep up with everybody. Yeah. They always are like, oh, you're such a lightweight. You're this, you're that. But when you need a break or when you need to take a second to yourself to kind of collect, You should have people around who support you in doing that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you mentioned a really key thing there where it's like someone won't shame you because, I mean, we've all maybe been guilty of it. We've all received it. We've all seen it where someone you want to leave a party or someone's feeling overwhelmed and they're like, don't be lame. Like, come on, it just started. It's only 10 p.m., right? That happens Mm -hmm. a lot. Um, And when, like you said, when we have someone that really understands like, where we're at with our recovery journey. Um, and I and I want to come back to being an ally, right? Like one of the important things of being an ally too is that not only are we here to support, but most of the cases, at least in my case, like I'm not doing the substance that my friend is is in recovery from, right? Like I am I am there with them on in like mostly in their sobriety too. Um, and I think that as an ally, we have a higher awareness of what not only like what it means to be in recovery but like more like curiosity around sobriety um around harm reduction right around some of these strategies tactics steps right and like realities of a recovery oriented lifestyle and so i i agree i think that having friends that you can actually talk to about you know your experiences and that can support in that is essential um, I also really like that she mentioned seed lip. I think we already mentioned them once, but I'm I love the fact that there is a there was a sober bar at UMS, right? Um, and that these cocktails were amazing. Like I I had a couple of them <laughs> or mocktails, I guess, right? They were so good. Like they were they were honestly better than like the alcoholic drinks. Oh yeah, the, that's the alcoholic drinks. <laughs> Because they uh, they had better ingredients, like better quality ingredients in them. They had like freshly squeezed lime, soda, right? Like agave versus like artificial fragrance and sugar and color and all sorts of things that just not my vibe. 
But so I, I really appreciate that like Seed Lip is really coming through at these festivals. Um, and I'm, I'm going to a festival actually in a couple of weeks and it's a completely alcohol free festival, which I think is amazing. And I've never heard of something like that. Like, yeah. And it's like an um, amazing band music, like, right. It's not like, it's like a kid's festival or you would think, you know, but it's, it is family friendly. Um, but it is an alcohol free festival. The, 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 substance that they serve is cacao <laughs> which is amazing which festival is this it's called unison festival is that here in colorado yeah it's in southern colorado it's close to durango um it's like pretty much on the border of new mexico and colorado um so yeah i'm i'm super excited about it i'll definitely come back and give some you know some insight on what that was like in terms of it being a completely alcohol free festival yet you know late nights and a lot of dancing a lot of drinking water and perhaps some cacao right um but i'm seeing that a lot of right a lot of uh, more festivals are really embracing this like sober curious concept right if anything um not to mention some like recovery friendly envi- creating recovery friendly environments like we oh I went to Jazz Fest a couple months ago and they had a recovery wellness center at Jazz Fest in New Orleans. Again, they were ser- I think they were serving like seed lip mocktails and they had people you could talk to and they had like fans. It's hot in New Orleans. <laughs> um, right. And then we're seeing like other festivals like Burning Man has camps completely dedicated towards for people in recovery that um, I think one of them is called like the Anonymous Village. And it's a supportive environment for people in recovery. Um, There's another one called Camp Stella, which is for diverse queer and queer friendly folks to enjoy Burning Man in a sober, right, recovery friendly way. Um, Bonnaroo has Sober Roo, (laughs) right? Uh, Coachella has sober sober cella. Um, so it's just like these really big festivals are are creating these really safe and supportive environments for people in recovery. And then also, not only are they creating the space for it, but they're also hosting, you know, daily daily recovery meetings. Um, they have wellness activities like yoga, right, and meditation. Um, yeah, like really just like a variety of things. I saw something on the Burning Man, I think on the anonymous camp one, anonymous village, um, which was like Shane Sally or something. And the the event itself or the like tent that it was in was for people to come and share their shameful stories. And then kind of like what, how they like recover or emerge, right? Kind of like the Phoenix, like rose from the ashes from the shame and at the end of it, they said, and that's why I don't drink. That's why I don't do drugs. Right. But they don't they don't start with that because they really want to welcome people that aren't necessarily in recovery to hear these stories, to participate and then perhaps become sober curious or recovery curious and then create that supportive environment after the fact. Real quick, I want to take a moment to appreciate the fact that it's called Soberella. And, and wait, these names are so silly. Soberella and sober, sober Roo and sober Cella. <laughs> sober Cella and sober Roo. I love it. <laughs> That's great. I love that these spaces are emerging. I personally think it's fun that they've got silly little yeah. names, but it kind of lightens the mood around it because a lot of people Definitely. think of people who are in recovery who may be practicing moderation or sobriety as killjoys almost exactly yeah they're not you can have you can have so much fun without alcohol without substances young people in recovery pro social events prove that we do all kinds of stuff here like barbecues screenings game nights all kinds of stuff but that is kind of it's different but it's in the same vein as festivals because so many people really 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 associate festivals with substances and alcohol yep. same with raves same with anything that involves music and dancing yeah. because so many people need that kind of social lubricant 
of alcohol or substances to fully get into their body and be confident as they dance or sing along to to Mm -hmm. lyrics or whatever Mm -hmm. it may be. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging thing, right. To be, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not like speaking directly from experience, but I can imagine, and I have like some level of experience. I've talked about this in other podcasts around like what I, how I consider myself in recovery based on my journey with using substances, which I could probably dive into more at some point, but I, I went from someone who used substances to someone who doesn't really use substances, right? But I wouldn't consider myself fully in recovery. Um, But I do embrace, right, the concept of recovery, the lifestyle of recovery, really like these important conversations around harm reduction and moderation and mindful consumption are really at the forefront of like who I am and how I approach the world and my community. And and I'm part of a lot of communities that are alcohol-free and substance-free environments, which I really appreciate being in. Um, And it really comes back into like being rooted in wellness, right? And self-care. But I I can imagine that going from starting a journey in recovery and then not understanding how to go to a music festival, how to even go to a concert, right? Without these previous coping mechanisms, which maybe weren't the healthiest, right? Right can be one of the most challenging things because like, not only is that like your source of fun and movement, right. But it's also your community. Right. And so you're feeling left out from these spaces and environments and and experiences that maybe even like shaped who you are and are just like a core part of being a young adult. Right. Yeah. I mean, speaking from experience, I can say when I first started on my journey to recovery, I even have a hard time watching a movie with my roommates without smoking Mm -hmm. weed or having a drink, just even those most basic experiences, Mm -hmm. let alone going to a festival where alcohol and substance culture is the thing at a lot of yeah, a lot of them. That is what you associate with that festival, especially these larger festivals in the West, like Burning Man. A lot of people have this association with Burning Man that people are using psychedelics there, and et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. But that doesn't have to be the experience you have there. If you have your support system in place, if you have your drink, you have your water in your hand, whether it's sparkling or still. <laughs> So you can still have a very pleasurable and meaningful experience in those spaces without alcohol or substances. Definitely. And a lot of these really big bands, right? Like the Grateful Dead and Fish and these like jam bands, which are like notoriously known for a lot of drug use. And even like, I think there was like an article um, that mentioned that there were, so the Grateful Dead, for, for example, created the Wharf Rats, which is, Um, began as a, like a sober individuals and like a a recovery group, essentially for people who love the Grateful Dead. And then there was like a quote that was like, you know, because of the Grateful Dead, I had to go into recovery kind of thing. And a lot of, a lot of artists like recognize that. And so they, they're starting to create like micro communities within their own following, right. Or like cult (laughs) sometimes, that are specifically supporting the recovery lifestyle, right? Or like the recovery choice. Like, like I said, the Wharf Rats, the Grateful Dead, the Fellowship with a P with, from the band Fish, right? The Digital Buddhas from the band Disco Biscuits, um, the Gate Getaway, which is from Widespread Panic, right? So look, a lot of these like really big big, big bands and that have huge followings, people follow them all over the country, maybe over around the world, are creating these really safe communities within their community that make being in recovery and having a sober or like substance free experience totally okay. And I love that. It's just breaking down the stigma, especially when these big bands that are idolized say, hey, it's okay to be sober or in recovery or practicing moderation in our spaces it's very powerful because especially a lot of the things that we associate with stardom 
with these big bands, with these Mm -hmm. celebrities that we idolize is the party lifestyle. So when these icons, these celebrities come out and say, that's not necessary, you don't need to be on something or drinking to enjoy what we have to offer. That's very powerful. I love that. Yeah, I agree. I just love Sober Spaces as an emerging trend at festivals. I haven't really seen them much before the past couple years. Yeah. But I think especially since COVID, Mm -hmm. there has been this emerging sober curious trend where more people Mm -hmm. may not necessarily identify as being in recovery, but they are consciously choosing to limit their alcohol or substance usage or choosing to remain abstinent even if they never really had an addiction or a substance use disorder in the first place, just choosing to be mindfully healthy by participating in moderation or abstinence. So these spaces are really emerging in response to that. And it's just creating such a safer community at these types of events. Yeah, which is so needed, right? Because also post pandemic, right? We, we, so we were in this space where we were isolated and we didn't get to do anything for two and a half years. And then, you know, there's festivals and there's music shows and our nervous system, like can't really handle it. Right. Because we're, we were used to isolation and, and then we're in a, in a group of a thousand people, (laughs) you know, moving and shaking And so that could one like lead to higher use of substances because again, like trying to use these unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, And then therefore, you know, there's, there's more of a need to really talk about recovery at festivals to create these safe spaces, to have like the first aid tent, which like helped you, right? That first festival. Um, And that's always just like reassuring to know that there is, there is aid close by and that, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. Um, they also have, well, I think at the first aid festivals, but I, um, or for first aid tents, sorry, they have like mental health counselors there that are like supporting you if you're having a bad trip. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just really appreciating the emergence of all of, all of these kinds of supportive environments for, for people in recovery and just like, and everyone as a whole. And I think part of this is coming from the destigmatization of substance use. Yeah. Because before people may have known, yes, people are using substances at the festival I'm putting on, but we're just not going to talk about it. But now that we're acknowledging that, we're able to have counselors, like you said, at these first aid tents for people who may be experiencing a bad trip on psychedelics, because we know, we acknowledge that people are doing that at festivals. So we're better able to be prepared for those eventualities. Same with handing out Narcan or fentanyl test strips exactly. or just having medical personnel on hand. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So with that, let's move on to our personal tips for how to best navigate a healthy festival experience. We've already heard from Patrick and Hannah about mm-hmm. having water, enjoying the music, having your support system, seeking out mocktails. But what other tips would you give us, Lex? Don't forget about dancing your butt off. Dancing your butt off. That's part of enjoying the music. But <laughs> yes. I guess the movement aspect is important. Yes. So dancing your butt off. I'm all about the movement because it really allows us to like shake off maybe whatever anxiety we're feeling, right? If we're feeling that that anxiety around being around so many people with substances. Like I really love this practice of like, I'm just going to shake like a crazy person until it like just goes away. <laughs> I do that all the time. I actually did that right before we started this podcast episode. Yes, I just shook it out. You did. <laughs> all the nerves. It's true. I do it often as well. I just like go bounce up and down and just shake out my body. Um, it's really effective. So if you haven't tried it, I definitely recommend it. Um, another thing I would recommend is something that I've, I'm studying, right, to be a mental health and addiction counselor. And something I learned is the acronym HALT. Have you heard of this before? Um, I don't think I have, actually. What is it? What does it stand for? So HALT stands for Hungry, Angry, Lonely, and Tired. And so... okay. Uh-huh. Me all the time. 
Yeah, <laughs> well, so it's important to recognize these, right? In order to manage underlying negative emotions that are very, and like essentially these four stressors, right? Which could then cause irritation. Again, again, we mentioned anxiety, right? Um, desperation, right? And so if we can check in with ourselves and ask ourselves, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? Or, you know, we could flip it and be like, did I eat? Am I feeling happy? <laughs> Am I in community? Do I feel connected with others? Do I have energy right now? Right? If you want to like ship it, just flip it on the positive. And just having that reminder to check in with yourself to make sure that you're not hungry and that you're not about to go into like, a festival for two hours where you're not going to find food. Right. Um, and so just checking in with yourself again, I did something really bad happen. And are you about to go into an environment that's going to be highly triggering because there's so many substances happening, right? Did you just break up with your significant other? And then you're finding yourself in an environment that is going to allow you to fall into some bad habits because you're feeling angry or sad and you're going to allow yourself to like be in that, you know, um, again with lonely, right. Again, with being tired, like, can, can you avoid, can you rest? Like, can you, can you check in with yourself to see like, okay, what is it that I need right now in order to experience this festival in a positive way, essentially halt H A L T. I love that acronym. That's a bunch of good reminders that you just gave. And because not only is it important to just like always be in tune with yourself, but actively checking in and making sure you don't have any of these preemptive things like hunger, anger, loneliness that may lead to a more negative experience. It's important to actively check in and make sure that's not happening instead of just passively like oh I don't notice that I'm hungry mm -hmm. I don't notice that I'm angry because it still could be there running in the background but just taking the time to reflect and think and check in like okay what exactly am I feeling how may this expect how may this affect the experience I'm about to go have that's a great reminder mm -hmm. so I have another one I guess you have another one? Yeah. And then I'll, I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. What's yours? Really quick. So I, I really love this one. Um, so I would suggest volunteering at a festival, right? Like finding ways to be a part of something and to keep yourself busy, right? So the times you get to enjoy the music, that's amazing. You enjoy it, you're fully in it, right? But that you also have a like kind of like built-in community because you're like part of the you know the cafe I don't know like you're part of the cleanup crew you're part of the you know whatever it may be that the opportunities to volunteer but I think is like being part of something bigger and like integrating with community and that way could be a really helpful way to to just like feel connected and avoid right these like experiences of loneliness um they just have more resources around you at a festival i love that tip i look at these lists of tips for how to maintain recovery at festivals somewhat frequently and i don't think i've seen that one before so first of all props for creativity lex <laughs> but i like that you included this idea about creating community in that tip and having built-in people if you First, volunteer at some kind of booth. For example, keep the party safe. If you go hand out Narcan for a couple hours and then you go to the stages, exactly. chances are maybe someone's getting off the shift at the same time as you. You already know them. You know that they're on the same wavelength as you. You know that they're dedicated to recovery or helping people practice harm reduction. And you know that's a safe person. Awesome. What do you got, Meg? What do I have? So I feel like we already touched on this a little bit, but I want to expand. We talked about having a supportive friend with you. I feel like this is an extension of it, but having a conversation with that friend or those friends before you get to the festival, say, okay, I maybe have these specific triggers. If you see me acting 
this way, displaying these symptoms. Like if you notice that I'm not talking to you as much, maybe I'm not dancing as much as I was five minutes ago. Maybe I'm like looking around scared. Like Mm. those are signs that I need help. Just being open and honest with those people about what your triggers are, about how to recognize when you are maybe responding to them negatively, and then how to get out of that situation. Maybe it's just that they leave you alone. Maybe that's what you need. You say, you guys stay here. I'm going to go find a quiet tree. Or maybe it's like, I need one of you, two of you, all of you to come sit with me for a little bit and just help me calm down. But part of that is not only communicating what you need with the people who you're you're attending the festival with, but also first, first of all, knowing what you need. Checking in yeah. with yourself, kind of like you said with the HALT acronym, you need to know how you're feeling, what you need, but overall, you just need to be prepared. And kind of a shoot off of that is beforehand familiarizing yourself with the festival map, mm-hmm. knowing where Huge. the first aid tent is, yes, knowing if there are any sober spaces available to you, and then also just if there are quiet spaces that you can go to. Some festivals nowadays have all kinds of stuff available. There's yoga tents. If there's no sober space, or maybe they're the same space, yeah. but there are places you can go to just go collect yourself. But most of all, I think people need to recognize when they're no longer having fun and being okay with leaving if that's the best thing for them. Yeah, I think that's huge. Um just again, like, right, checking in with yourself, self-awareness is key. And then awareness of your environment is huge, right? Because there is nothing worse. I mean, there are maybe are things worse, but there is, you know, it sucks to feel anxious, feel, you know, triggered and not know where to go and have to figure that out, right? Within your state of panic survival, right? Within that state so I think that's a huge one is to like look at the map orientate yourself right like take the first day or the first hour you know to just like walk around the festival just find your point of orientation know where your camp is right um where know where the bathrooms are if there are (laughs) hopefully there are Mm. (laughs) yeah so I I think that's a big one and then like having an exit plan yeah The exit plan is so important, especially if you maybe drove with somebody who is your, I want to say getaway driver, but that sounds really dramatic. But if (laughs) if you have somebody who drove you, you drove in their car and you don't necessarily have your own transportation to get home, having funds set aside for Uber or Lyft, if that's an option in your area, is very important knowing that that may be an expense you have to have in order to have the safest, most satisfying, fulfilling recovery experience for you. Or if you do drive, making sure that you don't drive while you are actively very anxious or triggered. It is important to go take a minute if you are feeling like you're about to have a panic attack or Anything like that, just taking a second to find a space to calm down before you drive, make a world of difference. And it can honestly save a life. Yes, I agree with that. And then, you know, after the festival or after the show or whatever it may be, right? Like take some time to reflect and maybe even journal about your success. Like the the fact that you went to this experience, right? This music experience and that you got through it because I think it's really important to like reflect on the success, even if you had a bad moment, right? At the festival or at the show, there is there is progress and wins throughout the journey. And that is something that is important to write down and just like take a moment to really think about. I really like your point about not focusing on the bad moments. Because if the experience overall, if 90% of the experience was really positive and you're very proud of yourself for getting through it without having more drinks than you wanted to or having any drinks at all or using any substances, whatever your goal may have been, that's a win. 
even if 10% of the time you were very anxious or maybe you were having cravings or whatever it may be, that's still 90% a win. And yeah. that, in my book, that rounds up to 100, you know, that's I overall agree. a win. You did a good job. <laughs> yeah, rounds it up so just, to the highest percentage. <laughs> exactly. Just taking the time to recognize the effort you put in and the success you got out of it. And the progress you got out of it can be very rewarding. So I just want to end this episode by saying to all of you lovely listeners, whether or not you're choosing to be abstinent in festivals, practice moderation, whatever it may be, I still urge you to carry Narcan, carry mm-hmm. fentanyl test strips, know how to use them. Because you never know, even if you weren't using substances, even if nobody you're going with is using substances, you still may encounter people who need those resources. So I urge you to have them on you, know how to administer them. You can look up YPR's trainings or trainings from anywhere else. Lex, I know next month you're doing a Spanish Narcan training. Yeah, so if you're true. interested in that, make sure to check out Lex's training. This is true. You can find it on the website or on our social media. I'm sure it'll appear there at some point. So yeah, we have one on first Friday, which is in English. And then we're doing a very special one for recovery month, which is in September um, in Espanol. Yes. And I will link both of those in the show notes. So you can find those. And again, always on YouTube, always available. But just make sure that if you're carrying Narcan, you know how to use it. You know how to use that tool to save a life, potentially. Yeah. All right. Is there anything you want to close out with, Lex? Any l- final words? Huh. Embrace the music and the atmosphere and let that be really the, the essence of the experience you're in. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Share any recovery friendly festival tips that you may have in on our social media or email us at community at young people and recovery.org. Yes. And please, if you enjoy the recovery corner po- podcast, follow, subscribe, share, like anything that's available on whatever platform you're listening on. It really helps us grow and get to more people who may need to hear our recovery friendly message. Thank you in advance. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thanks, thank Meg. you for doing that in advance. Thank you to our listeners for listening with us today. And thank you, Lex, for having this conversation. Thank you, Meg. Thanks, YPR. <laughs> All right. Happy Wednesday, everybody. If you're listening on the day it comes out or happy whatever day, if you're not. <laughs> All right. Bye.